But we begin with a change in indigenous leadership, just as this country faces a reckoning over its colonial legacy. Roseanne Archibald has been elected as the new national chief of the Assembly of First Nations. Chief Archibald, first of all, congratulations and hello. Hi, how are you? Hi, Kathleen. Good. So the work starts now, uh, and there's always lots to do. Uh, it's been noted by many that there is divisiveness within the AFN, although I would argue many organizations of a similar nature have uh, issues with that. Just tell me a bit about how you think you can go about, um, you know, healing that and bringing the kind of unity that you are going to feel is necessary to, to do what uh, promises to be a, a very daunting job. Uh, thank you. I, I've actually, this would be the second time that I've entered into a role where an organization is in turmoil uh, and there is uh, noted difficulties in relationships. And I, as a former regional chief in Ontario, I was able to uh, do what I'm going to do nationally, which is respect First Nations and their treaty organizations across Turtle Island, across this country. And I plan on doing that by creating a national consensus-based agenda for change and action. And the foundation of that is peacemaking by strengthening our connections and our relationships. For me, relationships are everything. Uh, when you build a positive relationship with someone, you can stand shoulder to shoulder and move forward. And that's my plan with First Nations across this country. So as you make that effort, Chief Archibald, as you know, there are First Nations w w within uh, uh, the country that don't participate uh, with the Assembly of First Nations in a fulsome way. And, and perhaps uh, it, it's because of the notion that it's seen as, in some cases, pr probably too close uh, to governments, federal governments in particular, and, and, and too much, uh, I guess, a part of the bureaucracy and, uh, and less of a, a champion in some cases for, uh, for First Nations. And it, it, it's sort of more along the lines of uh, the, the settler culture that uh, it has sort of absorbed that and become a part of that. How, how do you respond to that in, in your leadership? Well, those things are true. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a colonial corporation. That's what it is. And certainly the colonial policies have impacted this organization in the past. And my goal and my drive is to actually evolve this organization and make it responsive to First Nations so that First Nations people everywhere can look at the AFN and see themselves represented. And this victory yesterday of becoming the first woman national chief is a part of that journey. It's a part of showing women across Canada, not only First Nation women, Indigenous women, all women, that there is a place for them in leadership. But at the AFN, Women across this country, First Nations women, now see that change has happened. And this is just the beginning. The real work started last night, right after the victory, and continues today. And I'm taking time to do a lot of media interviews, but we are hitting the ground running because I have been a regional chief at the table for three years. And I know the system, and I know that... We have to evolve it, and I do have a plan for that, and I certainly want to acknowledge that the corporate part of this organization has done tremendously good work. We need to separate the administrative and technical part of this organization from the political arm, and that's where I believe we've been lacking. We have what's called a confederacy of nations, which has not met in more than a decade. We don't have a strong political arm, and that's what I'll be working on in the next three years, is to create that separation so that the corporation can continue to do its good work and the political arm can do the political work that's needed. I was struck uh, when I was uh, seeing Perry Belgar tweeting about uh, your victory as chief, because he, he used the word, and words matter, because, uh, you know, he's very careful, and he acknowledged 
your victory. And, and I can't help but contrast that to uh, Mary Simon when she announced she would be appointed as governor general. He congratulated her. Uh, what do you read into that and what should we read into that? Well, he's the outgoing national chief. His time is done. And uh, I thank him for his service. And I don't really, it doesn't matter whether he congratulates me or not. I'm the national chief. I'm moving ahead with a strong agenda. And that's what I'm focused on. You said that you uh, also want to focus, understandably, on the unmarked burial sites at former residential schools. And of course, uh, everyone understands that uh, there is going to be more of that uh, over the weeks, months, uh, surely years ahead. Uh, c can you just g give me an idea uh, of what you're hoping, uh, I, I guess the, 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 the consequence, the outcome of this continued effort will be for First Nations? Well, there must be truth before reconciliation. And people are just starting to understand the truth of what Canada is built upon. It's built upon genocide. And that has been very hard for people, our allies especially, to digest and understand. And reconciliation really means that we have to work together. We have to heal. And there are 94 calls to action, and only 10 of them have been implemented fully in the last six years. And so I'm proposing in my first 100 days to examine a national action plan for all the TRC calls to action. And so there are many pieces to that. One is advocating for resources uh, to ensure that all the work can be carried out as we recover our children. Uh, as Chief DeLorme said in his interview, this, these are crime scenes. We need forensics. We need to know how these children died. We need to, these are crimes. You cannot bury a body without a grave. That's a crime. And so we need to really look at this situation and create a process that ensures that justice happens for all these children, for our First Nations, and that includes reparations. We had compensation to individual survivors, and that was just one piece of it. Whole communities are affected by intergenerational trauma. When you look at the social health, uh, social and health, social determinants of health, uh, you will see that a lot of that comes from intergenerational trauma. And so I'm going to be talking to the prime minister today, and this is something I will be bringing up with him on the 94 TRC calls to action and what we can do together to bring justice to our children. Uh there's an internal AFN uh, report looking to allegations of uh, harassment and bullying by you by former employees. It was shared uh, with the CBC. You've said you can't comment on it. Uh, but obviously that does uh, produce a bit of a cloud uh, over your leadership. And uh, I think people would be interested to know, um, you know, what you would do about supporting a whistleblower policy for the AFN and and also ensuring that uh, there is transparency around these allegations that have been leveled against you so that people feel they're being fully investigated and not in any way uh, influenced uh, by your uh, leadership now of the AFN. Well, you, of course, I cannot uh, speak to the, the confidential reports that have been leaked. I, I am bound by confidentiality, and so are my fellow regional chiefs. And in terms of this, I can't speak to the report at all, but it is important to point out that there were no formal complaints made, and I was never interviewed for this report. That's a really important fact. In fact, the process uh, for the investigation did not even follow the guidelines that are outlined in the AFN Code of Conduct. You know, $250,000, maybe more, I'll find out, have been spent on investigations that actually were launched without any written complaints. Not one written complaint launched this process. That's an important fact. And I've always said that 
a lot of this began as reprisals against me because I spoke the truth. I said, we have problems at AFN. That started in December when Resolution 13 on gender-based violence uh, hit the floor. That was the beginning of uh, my journey uh, into very difficult times as a leader. And immediately, within minutes, I received an email from a chief, a harassing email, right away. And so, you know, when you speak the truth, and we've seen this with other people who have spoken out, like Jody Wilson-Raybould, you know, there is this negative impact that comes back in the form of reprisal and retaliation. And I have had to go through that process, and I've done it with dignity and grace I've continued to walk forward. I continue to work. Uh, you know, all through that whole process, I was sitting at the Ontario Vaccine Task Force advocating for First Nations to receive their vaccinations as quickly as possible, both on and off reserve, and to get the second dose accelerated. I kept working, you know, because I knew that at some point the truth would come out and it will come out. And at this point, I can't discuss it because it is an HR matter. It's sensitive. It's legal. Uh, but I want to tell you one thing that I have been 100 percent committed to building work, uh, safe workplaces for everyone that I have ever worked with. Um, I, you know, safe, healthy workspaces. Uh, for not only the AFN, but everywhere that I've worked. And I've always treated people with dignity and respect. And I've always sought to bring those values to the culture of the workplaces that I've been trusted to lead. And so that's what I will do in this term. I will bring that same deep and abiding love and care to the Assembly of First Nations, and we will heal from this process. Uh, we're out of time, but I would be remiss if I did not ask you. You mentioned Jody Wilson-Raybould, and of course, uh, you're probably uh, aware that the uh, chiefs in Manitoba and B.C. are asking for Carolyn Bennett's resignation as the Minister of Canada Indigenous Relations, and that goes back to the back and forth uh, regarding Josie Wilson-Raybould. Do you support that call for her resignation? This is a matter that... Um, I've been asked about before, and and I want you to know what kind of person I am. I, I'm not this kind of person who will comment on who should resign and who should not resign. I always ask people to apologize, unreservedly apologize, for any mistakes they make. And it is upon uh, Minister Bennett to, to decide her future. It is upon the Prime Minister and the Cabinet that is uh, in, in the same way that the prime minister cannot ask for a regional chief to resign or cannot demand that a chief in a community resign. And to me, that's about respecting other people's processes. This is your government. This is a non-Indigenous government. Um, and so that's how I approach the issue. So when somebody makes a mistake, I will ask them to apologize. And you're satisfied with how she's responded then? Is that what you're telling me? No, I'm not telling you that. <laughs> okay. Then what are you telling me? I mean, you say she needs to you've apologize. Asked me, you've, asked me, you've asked me if I think she should resign, and I just told you that's not how I operate. I don't operate that way. Okay. But you do feel that she yeah. should apologize. So I was just wondering if you're satisfied with how she's responded. You know, the person you have to ask about who is satisfied with the apology is Jody Wilson-Raybould. I have a tremendous amount of respect for her. And if she decides that that apology is something that she can accept, then that is her call. Okay. I thank you so much for your time, Chief Archibald. Thank you. Thank you. Miigwech. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.